Welcome to the PSA roundtable entitled Anarchist Studies Still Marginal After 20 Years. My name is Alex Pritchard and I'm the co-convener of the UK Political Studies Association's Anarchist Studies Network and the convener of tonight's conference roundtable. We've got five great speakers lined up and our audience is drawn from the membership of the PSA Anarchist Studies Network and the independent North American Anarchist Studies Network. A recording of this roundtable will be submitted as part of the digital content uh, at the Political Studies Association Annual Conference in April this year. Uh, the PSA's conference theme is Politics from the Margins, and I thought that provided a nice little hook to get us all to reflect on uh, the changing place and role of anarchist studies in the academy. And I also wanted us to have a, a bit of a, um, a trip down memory lane and think about some of the main achievements of anarchist studies over the past 20 years too. So let me just say a few words of that, about that to introduce uh, tonight's discussion. So in the blurb to the first iteration of the ASN website, explaining who we were, Jesse Cohn, who's one of our speakers tonight, remarked that at the turn of the 20th century, um, there was more of a memory of anarchism on the streets than in the academy. And one of the aims we had in setting up the ASN in 2005 was to rectify this, to bring anarchism in all its faded glory into academic debates. And what made this possible, I think, as Ben Francis remarked, is the relative decline, if not collapse, of actually existing Marxist-Leninism and the hegemony of the old left in higher education. And so that left a little bit of a gap. So in the last 20 years, then, what have been our main achievements? I suppose if you go back a little bit further, 30 years ago, uh, the journal Anarchist Studies was established by Tom Cahill, amongst others. And 20 years ago, Saul Newman published From Bakunin to Lacan, an anti-authoritarian politics and dislocation of power. And that kick-started uh, the debate around the history and future of anarchism. And it's been 16 years since we established the Anarchist Studies Network as a PSA specialist group. 14 years since uh, colleagues and comrades in North America established the North American Anarchist Studies Network. And then finally, 10 years ago, four of those central to the founding of the ASN and North American ASN set up the Contemporary Anarchist Studies monograph series, which now boasts 15 titles uh, and more forthcoming. The aim of those initiatives or these initiatives has been to support activists and academics who want to write on anarchism broadly conceived. And it's worked to some extent. Uh, there's been a proliferation of ac academic writing on anarchism. There have been articles in mainstream and discipline leading journals, as well as the subdisciplinary ones. There have been book chapters and almost an unimaginable array, array of uh, anarchist themes. We've seen the publication of outstanding monographs, edited volumes, PhD theses, many of which have bridged the academy activism divide in multiple and really creative ways. You can find uh, work in bibliographies, incidentally, on the ASN website at www.anarchiststudiesnetwork.org. So the PSA conference theme of politics from the margins is a useful hook on which to hang a set of reflections and reminiscences, reminiscences on contemporary anarchist studies and its place in higher education. The sorts of questions it prompted me to ask included so what are anarchism's main contributions to higher education? Where might it go in the future? Is anarchism marginal in higher education and in the world out there? Or should it be? Or who cares? Indeed, has anarchist studies failed? Our speakers have interpreted this brief anarchically, as I'd expected, but let me just introduce them to you all briefly. So our first speaker tonight will be Jesse Cohn. He's Associate Professor of English at Purdue, author and translator of Daniel Col uh, Colson's uh, Petit Lexique, uh, Danachism and his own Anarchism in the Crisis of Representation. And he was one of the founders of the North American Anarchist Studies Network. Kathy Ferguson joins us from Hawaii, where she's Professor of Political Thought and is author of the seminal biography of Emma Goldman, Politics from the Streets. Uh, Ruth Kinner is Professor of Political Theory at uh, Loughborough University, an author of books on Kropotkin, uh, amongst others, and one of the foremost um, scholars of the emergent and drivers, I suppose, of the emergence of anarchism in higher education in the UK. Saul Newman is professor of political thought and a prolific exponent of the post-anarchist tradition. 
Anne Elizabeth Vasileva uh, got a PhD from Loughborough a few years ago, now teaches at the Free University of Brighton and is a co-convener of the Anarchist Studies Network. Uh, but I'm not sure she's been able to make it just yet. So my name is Alex Pritchard. I'm Associate Professor in International Relations at the University of Exeter. And I've got three books coming out this summer that I'm going to give, give a very quick plug to. Uh, one's a, a translation, an annotated translation of Proudhon's War and Peace. Second is uh, Anarchic Agreements, How to Build Durable group, Groups and Coalitions, which is co-authored with Ruth uh, Thomas and Seeds for Change. And uh, the third is a very short introduction to anarchism. Uh, Oxford have asked me to, to write a new edition uh, updating Colin Ward's. Okay, so this session is going up on the ASN website, but we're also going to be publishing the comments uh, in a as a critical exchange in the journal Contemporary Political Theory next year. And that contribution will also have um, words from Lucien van der Velt too, who unfortunately couldn't make it this evening. All right, so without further ado, I am going to introduce you to Jesse Curran. Jesse, over to you. All right. Um, oh, shoot. Uh, can, can you enable screen sharing? Can I enable screen sharing? Uh, can I? That is a good question. I'm not sure I can. Can you not do it? Do I have to make you a? Yeah, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Huh. I have no idea is the simple answer. You can make me a host. host. How do I do that? Let's have a look. Okay, let me make you a host just a sec. Okay. All right. Oh. Okay. Do you have it? No. All right. You might have to email that to me. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Here we are. Make co host. There we are. Sorry. I did. I was pressed the wrong button. My mistake. Okay. All righty. All right. Oh, great. Okay, the whole plan comes together. Okay, um, th thanks, Alex. Uh, I, I wanted to take this opportunity to explore anarchist studies as, as a, a marginal field of study. Not only a field of study that it has been marginalized, but one that falls on the margins, that, that, uh, that lives and subsists on the margins of the university itself. That is to say, I'll speak of anarchist studies as a kind of para-academic practice a practice of knowledge production that in some respects mimics or perhaps even mocks the, the practice of the university, but which is not really containable by the university and it's aptly named disciplines. Even so, the relation of anarchist studies to the university is a perpetual source of controversy as we'll see. Um, so not, not to rehearse some of the, those dates that, that you mentioned, but, but uh, it, it, it might seem that defining anarchist studies as a para-academic practice is already to choose a very short and recent timeline, um, right? Uh, the, the oldest date here is, is uh, for the Institute of Social, Social Ecology. Um, after after the, the 1960s, um, the, the new social movements were folded into the academy as, as women's studies, Afro-American studies, gay and lesbian studies programs and, and departments were formed. Um, in this kind of accommodationist university, Marxist theory had an especially firm purchase. Some have suggested that it was structurally well-suited for academia. Anarchist studies formed after this pattern only, only really emerges after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, so, so such is what one theorization might suggest. Um, on the other hand, we might look back at the history of the international anarchist press and find that it wears the robes of academia from the, almost the very beginning, often as a kind of disguise so that radical ideas could be circulated in public in a, a more acceptable form, eluding the censors. And indeed, it hosts some rich threads of speculation, uh, particularly in social sciences, while also showing a marked interest in the natural sciences. These journals typically operated at a distance from the university and from its form while imitating its content. Whereas the protagonists of the late 20th and early 20th, 21st century formations uh, uh, in the recent model are typically a mix of university students and professors and activists, um, often occupying multiple categories at the same time, uh, the writers and readers of journals like Ciencia Social seem more often to be autodidacts or professionals like engineers, economists, doctors, and so forth, contributing their expertise. I want to suggest that by thinking of anarchist studies as operating not purely outside, but on the margins of the university, 
we can locate some important precedents for the kind of, of, uh, of anarchist studies that we're doing here and now. We could begin by following our academic protagonists, both faculty and students, into para-academic territory. Jean Metron suggests that before the 1890s, in France at least, students were regarded as primarily belonging to the bourgeois camp. In December 1891, a group of, of uh, revolutionary social, socialist students, um, so, socialist internationalist students in French, the ESRI, formed in, in, the, in the Latin Quarter of Paris, uh, first at, at a, uh, a student's lodgings, and then a, a Fourierist uh, library on, on the Rue Mouffetard, and finally in its own quarters. Our effort, wrote, wrote Marc Pierrot, uh, a medical student, was to educate ourselves and help students and medical students, uh, sorry, sorry help, help emancipate the workers. The 20 odd members of ESRI were at least initially composed primarily of law students and medical students, numbering among them several Russians studying at the Sorbonne, five or six of them being women. ESRI's politics were ecumenical to begin with, but by 1894, anarchism had clearly become the group's primary motivating passion. Unfortunately, the drift of many students in the group was towards more moderate politics and more conventional careers after college, as Metzpon points out. Uh, there are, however, some, some truly interesting developments out of the experiment that ESRI was. Uh, Metron sees the ESRI as having exerted a certain influence on revolutionary syndicalism and encouraged anarchist communists to join the un unions. And then there's the fascinating case of Marie Isidorovna Goldsmith. Uh, among the early participants in the ESRI, uh, Goldsmith gra graduated from the Sorbonne in biology in 1894, earned her doctorate in 1915, then continued working there as a scientist um, and with her fellow scholar, Yves Delage, she pursued the study of links between the evolutionary biology and psychology um, in, in an effort to bridge the gap between Kropotkin's concept of mutual aid as a factor in evolution and the phenomenon of the mutual aid instinct. Um, there is in, indirect evidence that, that um, their work may have influenced Kropotkin's later writings on evolutionary biology. So here, here we see the traffic between anarchism and academia becoming bi-directional. Goldsmith brings anarchist values uh, and priorities to her career as a biologist. And as a biologist, she brings scientific knowledge to the service of anarchism. However, her work follows an academic pattern of citation and addition to knowledge, finding a gap in the Kropotkinian lit literature and making a new contribution. Um, in the immediate wake of the Russian Revolution, the notorious Gordine brothers, Abba and Wolf, advocated for the creation of an altogether new type of academic institution, the Sociotechnicum. Anarchist schools, of course, have a long and storied history, but the Sociotechnicum was to be something different, a special kind of anarchic technical school, a special institution of social experimentation that would research and teach the invention, perfection, and artificial cultivation of social apparatuses. While resolutely rejecting both religion and science, including Marxian social science, they insisted on taking up the same technical attitude toward the social that humanity had already assumed in regard to the natural world. At the same time, the, socio the sociotechnicum was intended to shelter sociotechnicians, that is, social builders and inventors, from persecution by those, but uh, both by those in power and public opinion. Kind of like Athens exarchia, they imagined the sociotechnicum would stand in an exarchic relationship to the Soviet government and legal system, quietly producing social innovations such as. Uh, Wolf's own invention, uh, AO, an artificial language built on 11 mathematical signs. This hope was short-lived. Uh, both brothers were forced to flee Soviet persecution in, in 1926. Other anarchist student organizations and publications like the French Esprit appear well before the 1960s. In the 1920s, the, the Federation des Estudiantes de, de Chile, uh, the, the Fetch, in its publication Claridad, were, were made, uh, made over from the inside by anarchist students in a manner that might remind us of the famous case of, of the University of Strasbourg in 1967 and the circumstances surrounding the publication of the notorious Situationist tract on the poverty of student life, a consideration of its economic, political, sexual, psychological, and notably intellectual aspects and a few ways to cure it. A little before the student explosion of the 1960s, we find this intriguing, if short-lived publication, um, University Libertarian, not uh, notable, if not only, if, if not for its con contributors who, uh, who seem to overlap with the contributors to the better known journal Anarchy. Um, no, uh, notable for its creation of an anarchist counterpublic 
located specifically in the university. Indeed, in the February 1962 issue of Anarchy, uh, Tony Gibson, who wrote for University of Libertarian, writes up his own study on the anarchist personality. Uh, he, he writes, letters were published in Freedom, the Anarchist Weekly, and later in the University of Libertarian, asking for anarchists to volunteer for an investigation of the anarchist personality. In all, 44 anarchists volunteered and completed the battery of tests. In addition, two people volunteered and withdrew, um, and, and then withdrew, and another person took half the, the test battery and then withdrew. Eight of the volunteers were, were women. The age range of the group was 21 to 75 years, the model age being in the early 30s. So this kind of anarchist self-study provides the kind of demographic breakdown that um, one, one only used to find in the, in the reports of Paris police infiltrators. It's fascinating, it's a snapshot of the, of the time, and again, illustrates the, that close-knit circuit between the academic and the activist aspects of anarchist studies. It is an investigation launched from within the academia. Gibson was then a research assistant at the Institute of Psychiatry in South London, but with the readership going well beyond it. Perhaps it should not be surprising to find in, this, in the uh, April 1965 issue of Le Monde Libertaire, a call for a renewal of anarchist studies, Recherche Libertaire. The, the author, René Foren, uh, AKA René Fugler, um, never finished his doctoral dissertation, which was to be on the apocalyptic imagination in revolutionary movements. There again was a, a version of anarchist studies as the, the use of university resources to produce anarchist self-knowledge, anarchist studies as self-study. Uh, but his 1965 call for the renewal of anarchist studies framed them in a different way. So here, Foren imagines anarchist studies as being concerned with the elaboration of an anarchist anthropology, um, but also an anarchist sociology, psychology, and history that would be dedicated to understanding how freedom develops and unfolds in the world. So first, anarchist studies is defined as a specifically anarchist contribution to, anarchist, uh, to, to ac academic knowledge. And, and then further, he asks, what are the conditions, the criteria, the processes of a libertarian psychology? Have the human sciences advanced the resolution of the problems posed by anarchist theoreticians? Can anarchism offer fertile hypotheses in certain areas of sociology or psychology? In other words, anarchist studies seeks not only to learn from the university things valuable to the anarchist movement, but it also seeks to elaborate itself by means of its own theoretical resources. Quote, it is for the elucidation of such a method that we will reread socialist and anarchist theorists. Thus, we can seek in Proudhon's work, the first outline of a libertarian sociology, the first elaboration of a libertarian dialectic. Anarchist studies uh, on this model posits anarchism not only as an object of study, but also as a source of knowledge, the source of potential methods of knowledge production with a valuable theoretical corpus of its own, not unlike Marxism then. Here's what that looked like. Uh, note the first installment of, of Gerard Gilles' essay here, Problems of Libertarian Anthropology. The experimental Tol Tolstoy College at SUNY Buffalo became, as Jennifer Wilson notes, an early center for queer studies. Charles Weigel, um, a publisher at AK Press, writes, in the mid 80s, I taught at Tolstoy College, an anarchist academic unit at the, the State University of New York, Buffalo. Yes, that's right, anarchists receiving salaries from a state university, courtesy, courtesy of a student strike 15 years earlier that demanded, among other things, that SUNY fund an anarchist college. Unfortunately, I was the last instructor hired and Tolstoy College folded soon thereafter. So under the neoliberalism of Reagan and Thatcher, the space available for anarchist studies was already beginning to shrink. One minute, Jesse. Oh, yep. Oh, four, four minutes? Okay. One um, minute, one minute, if you could conclude. Right. Thanks, okay. All right, let me skip forward. Okay, so um, what might all of these experiences mean for the future of anarchist studies? It seems to me that the research directions indicated by Marie Goldsmith and Rene Foran have not been exhausted, uh, but the neoliberal and Trumpian attacks on education might make us think about taking seriously Fred Moden and Stefan Harney's advice, plunder what you can before the barbarians arrive. Uh, as Chuck Morris, founder of the Institute for Anarchist Studies, remarked recently, the various uh, warnings that we hear throughout this history against becoming overly academicized hit differently now that the, now that the academy itself is falling to pieces. Uh, since the end of the 90s, the, the problem hasn't been to find activities to engage in now while awaiting the anarchist millennium. Um, it, it's a, 
uh, the anarchist movements are, are now on the streets again. Perhaps the Gordian brothers were onto something when they proposed a different kind of institution altogether to shelter some very practical studies in social construction. Um, at the same time, I, I think that there's room for development in the, the natural sciences um, along the lines of John Slavin's Indie Lab in Richmond, Virginia, pictured above, um, where he researches new sustainable ways to harvest solar energy, for instance. Our ranks were once filled by students studying medicine and law rather than sociology and history. So we need more chemists and engineers, computer scientists and epidemiologists, and yes, experts in law and medicine. I'll conclude there. Thank you, Jesse, that's fantastic. I'm gonna hand over without further ado to Kathy. I can see some applause. Thanks, Jesse. Over to you, Kathy. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. At least it's morning here. I am coming to you from Honolulu. Um, I'd like to offer a, a brief sense of what kind of intellectual space I think anarchism offers and then give three examples of places or directions that I hope we continue to go uh, with our work. So the first, the sort of what kind of space is anarchism? I suggest that it's a, what I call space of invitation. Anarchist philosopher David Week characterizes anarchism as, quote, the generic social and political idea that expresses negation of all power, sovereignty, domination, and hierarchical division, and a will to their dissolution, end quote. Literary scholar Sadia Hartman succinctly remarks, quote, anarchism is an open and incomplete word, and in this resides its potential. Putting these ideas together, anarchism as opposition to hierarchies and anarchism as perpetually incomplete suggests that anarchism is a fertile site for nurturing the sorts of encounters that feminists have called intersectionality. Critical legal theorist Kimberly Crenshaw characterizes intersectionality as an open-ended intellectual tool for simultaneously apprehending, quote, both the structural and the dynamic aspects, end quote, of power relations. Reflecting on intersectionality's travels since she coined the term in 1984, Crenshaw highlights, quote, the interpretive, creative, highly contested, and sometimes perilous work of integrating insurgent knowledge into established, often conservative, discursive communities, end of quote. Anarchism and intersectionality share the goal of critically examining familiar as well as emergent flows of power and meaning understanding their relations to one another. This space of invitation in anarchism beckons critical political thinkers and activists to weave new threads into the mix, cultivating fresh relations. Anarchism's intersectional turn is producing a rich cacophony of elaborations. Indigenous anarchism, anarcho-blackness, anarcho-feminism, queer and trans anarchism, ecological anarchism, anarchic species relations, and no doubt many others. Here I will focus on three directions that I hope will continue to develop. The first is indigenous anarchism. The second is anarchism developing with the resources of new materialism. And the third is anarchism emergent in the decorative book arts. The first of these indigenous anarchism already has a rich intellectual and political grounding upon which to build. Um, as well as a strong presence in the world of social movements. While the second and the third, the new materialism and the book arts, those are certainly less familiar, but nonetheless, they are making an appearance. In the remainder of this talk, I wanna look briefly at each of these and suggest ways that they can enrich anarchist studies. First, please let me take a small detour into a different plea, which is a call for historical depth and empirical detail in research on anarchism. I so appreciated Jesse's um, uh, PowerPoint just now for the fabulous uh, dive into archival uh, sources that he must have had to do to assemble that. Ruth Kenna and Alex Pritchard rightly warned us a few years ago against, quote, an endless celebration of a few dehistoricized and decontextualized principles, end of quote. So instead of endlessly reflecting on what good ideas we have, I hope for work that builds on deep dives into relevance, relevant evidence. A friend of mine calls this ass in the grass research. Thorough explorations of archives, patient attentive interviews, extensive ethnographic participation in movements or communities, and thorough careful reading of texts. We already have good models. Paul Averick set the gold standard, in my view, for broad and careful historical research in the modern school movement. 
historians from below, such as Chris Elam's Anarchism in the City and Kenyon Zimmer's Immigrants Against the State, build detailed stories by digging deeply into archives and then theorizing those stories with anarchist resources. Meticulous participant observation of contemporary movements, such as Sarah Fessenden's fine dissertation on food, not bombs, eschews vague generalities in favor of thorough, careful analysis of what they're doing and how they're doing it and why they're doing it. So whatever direction we go in, I, I think that encouraging ourselves and our students and whoever to really take the idea of thickness uh, very seriously in uh, figuring out what we wanna say. All right, so the first of my three directions, in indigeneity. Indigenous encounters with anarchism bring a, a multitude of fresh energies. Kanaka Maoli scholar, that means native Hawaiian scholar Kahala Johnson suggests we quote, acknowledge the cacophony in such encounters in order to explore them further. I briefly take up two of his ideas, two of our ideas here, challenges to dominant understandings of time and to hegemonic practices of governance. Both anarchism and indigeneity are attached to what literary scholar Mark Rifkin calls discrepant temporalities. From hegemonic perspectives, indigenous life, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> is seen as lost in the past. Its adherents either vanished or fixed in a vague pre-modern haze. Framing time in relation to land, water, other animals, and responsibilities to prior and future generations, indigenous time struggles against colonial time with its investments in progress and quote, civilization. Anarchist time similarly struggles against state time. While state-centric time views anarchism as hopelessly utopian, anarchists instead find practices of mutual aid and prefiguration already seeded into our past and our presence. British anarchist Colin Ward sees the elements of anarchism as already visible, quote, in the interstices of the dominant power structure. If you want to build a free society, the parts are all at hand, end of quote. Indigeneity and anarchism intersect in their untimeliness, refusing to be relegated either to an allegedly lost past or an unachievable future. Okay, so that's the time connection. The governance uh, connection is a little different. Anarchism and indigeneity imagine self-governance differently, but in ways that can resonate with one another. The conflict appears obvious. After all, David Week named sovereignty as one of the power arrangements anarchists must unitarily oppose. Kanaka Maoli scholar Kehau Kawanui sketches this conflict, quote, anarchists who are not indigenous may understand sovereignty as always already a form of domination through a state monopoly on the use of violence against its citizens, end of quote. Yet there is more than one way to understand sovereignty, just as there is more than one way to imagine time. And indigenous sovereignty activists, quote, are often referring to their collective inherent authority to govern and assert their self-determination as politics, end of quote. Indigenous struggles for sovereignty challenge anarchists to envision sovereignty, not necessarily as an alibi for state power, but as also a possible source of practices of self-governing. Another Kanaka Maoli scholar, my colleague Noalani Goodyear Kaupua, offers stories from the Hawaiian sovereignty movement in which resistance was, quote, constituted through direct action for aloha aina, that's love of the land, and collective decision making. End of quote. Goodyear Kaupua suggests that rather than following the directives of leaders or seeking the permission of authorities, Hawaiian sovereignty activists create change by living differently. Quote, it is in the process of these mobilizations rather than in the final positions enunciated that revolutionary potential is located. Adam Barker and Jenny Pickrell point out that indigenous geographies can be an opportunity for non-indigenous anarchists to find their own new way of looking at and being in place. End of quote. Kahala Johnson continues this challenge by exploring indigenous demands for deoccupation and reestablishment of pre-colonized nations in conversation with anarchist critiques of all states. Indigeneity brings fresh insights and challenges to encounters with anarchism. So now let me move to my other two uh, ideas, new materialism and book arts. New materialism, um, along with intersectional efforts to think differently about relations between humans and other species, inquiry into relations between humans and non-organic others can also open anarchism to new directions. New materialism is a theoretical cousin to network theory and assemblage theory, which have been recruited by numerous writers on anarchism, including Benedict Anderson's global uh, analysis of global anarchism as a, quote, vast rhizomal network, and Constant Bantman's discussion of anarchism's, quote, informal militant networks connecting French and British anarchists. New materialists push network theory and assemblage theory in the direction of what Jane Bennett calls thing power. 
Jane Bennett explains the liveliness of matter as, quote, the capacity of things, edibles, commodities, storms, and metals, not only to impede or block the will and designs of humans, but also to act as quasi-agents or forces with trajectories, propensities, or tendencies of their own. Non-organic matter is brought into the intersectional mix of actors and actions as lively, as capable of acting and being acted on. I have found new materialism indispensable in analyzing anarchist print culture, bringing presses, ink, paper, and letters into the picture as participants in relations making anarchism happen. New materialism can forge rich connections with the more familiar materialism of Marxist-inspired class and state analyses, as well as with indigenous understandings of living forces in non-human entities. Bringing non-organic things into intersectional relation with other flows of power just encourages us to theorize them not as a static background, but as the vibrant partakers in political relations. And then my last point, the decorative book arts. During the late 19th to mid 20th centuries, William Morris in England and Joseph Fischel in the US led a movement to rescue printing from its industrial degradation and bring fine printing into radical politics. Morris and Ischel embodied the anarchist commitment to combining intellectual and manual work beauty and function, art and craft. In one of hundreds of letters sent to Ischel by appreciative readers, Forrest Fraser of Huntsville, Missouri wrote to thank Ischel for his work. He writes, type, illustrations, paper and binding fit the text perfectly. A beautifully printed page gives the same thrill as a beautiful painting or sculpture. Fine printers like you have lifted a craft into the realm of a great creative art, end of quote. Readers of publications printed by Morris, Ischel, and other skilled anarchist printers were simultaneously offered intellectual, political, and aesthetic rewards. The content of the material interacted with the look and feel of the page to create both intellectually powerful and aesthetically pleasing encounters. PM Press's striking new edition of Kropotkin's Mutual Aid revisits the tradition of radical book arts. Illustrator Enno Bonzo is inspired by the creative crafts, arts and crafts movement initiated by Morris. Bonzo lays out the page in much the same way as did Morris, with ornate borders of interlocking leaves and flowers, often with dramatic black backgrounds. The side panels introduce graceful scenes of working people laboring and relaxing, building a new and just world together. Art historian Alan Antliff observes that such illustrations heighten the visual presentation of anarchist values through, quote, the rhythmic interplay of arabesque lines and compositional arrangement, end of quote. Another recent contribution to radical book arts is Charles Overbeck's lovely book, The Tramp Printers, Forgotten Trails of Traveling Typographers. Overbeck's printers travel across the dramatic black cover and nestle on the stippled pages of his book. Overbeck constructs the page much as Morris and Ischel did. His generous margins let the text breathe, while illustrations, illuminated letters, and graceful fonts encourage readers to pause and notice the page as both art and text. Bonzo sees book arts as well as street arts as expressing anarchism's life world, quote, accessible and immediate, an active and participatory part of everyday life. So in conclusion, the goal of bringing indigeneity, new materialism and book arts to the fore is not to reduce them to one another, but to see their relationships and look for ways that they resonate with each other and with other developments in anarchist studies. Critical conversations allow frictions to be rearticulated while still learning from one another. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, I'm sure there's uh, virtual applause going on all over the place right now. Um, I'm going to hand over to Ruth, if you're there. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Alex. Um, thanks, Kathy, and thanks, um, Jess. Uh, difficult acts to follow. Um, like Jesse, I'm, I'm going to use the idea of marginalisation to think about uh, the past and future of anarchism and to, to think about where anarchist thought sits within the, within the academic discipline. So my starting point is Peter Laslett's announcement uh, of the death of political philosophy in 1956. And although his announcement has been mocked uh, as inaccurate since he made it, uh, it serves as a useful reminder, I think, of how marginal mainstream political theory appeared to be in the relatively recent past. It also prompted an interesting response from Isaiah Berlin six years later. So presenting an expansive historical account of political thought, quote, between the death of Newton and the birth of Darwin, Berlin discovered the enduring strength of political theory in the inherent contestability of the central political questions that political philosophers ask. 
And his example was, why should anybody obey anybody else? While it's interesting that Berlin asked an anarchistic question about authority to illustrate the vitality of political theory, the more interesting suggestion from my perspective is his claim that the well-being of political theory rests on the ways in which, big, in which the big questions it asks can be formulated. So following his lead, I want to ask, how can the central questions posed by anarchists or anarchism be formulated? And how does this formulation explain its marginality in political theory? And my contention is that 19th century anarchists asked two big questions. And obviously that's a, a reductive uh, account of anarchist political theory, but it's, it's just a, a thought experiment. The first of these questions chimed with sociology more immediately than it did with political theory. And the second, which was, I think, directed towards political theory, encouraged insularity just when, when political theory re-emerged from its margins in the 1960s and 70s, opening new opportunities for anarchist interventions. So to, to, to start, I want to go back to, to Proudhon in 1840 and what is property and think about what it was he said he was doing when he wrote this book. Um, and what he says is that what is property is, quote, an application of method to the problems of philosophy. It is designed to reveal the origins of inequality and show how all existing institutions can serve as instruments of equality. So no lack of ambition on Proudhon's part. Proudhon also wanted to perfect theories of association hitherto proposed from Plato and Pythagoras to Babeuf, Saint-Simon and Fourier and set out to show that his proposals had immediate practical application. So in short, Proudhon explored principles of social organization. He investigated the forces shaping association, their constitutional forms, and the extent to which competing principles perpetuated domination. His core question was something along the lines of what social forces explain the phenomenon of the sovereign state and how can they be resisted? His work resonated with Bakunin's critique of Rousseau's social contract, with Kropotkin's political sociology, with Landauer's denunciation of historical materialism and dystopian state socialism, and with Rocker's defense of individual sovereignty in a federated decentralized European Union. Notwithstanding Proudhon's misogyny, it even found an echo in Voltaire Declare's advocacy of women's liberation and direct action. So the, the second question anarchists asked, I think, is what is anarchism? And this was a question that they asked primarily um, in order to try and um, explode the myths that were being perpetuated about anarchism, particularly about the, the violence of anarchism. So a lot of literature that's produced um, by you know, Alexander Berkman, Al um, Emma Goldman, Kropotkin, you name it, everybody wrote something about anarchism, tend to be, tended to be written in order to uh, demythologize the, the, these stereotypes. But so although it came from this um, sort of rather defensive stance, I suppose, this work also elicited a set of reflections on the anarchist movement's emergence, uh, on the distinctiveness of anarchist socialism and its values, its concepts and its principles, thus laying the foundations for the analysis of anarchist traditions, ideology and political cultures. When political theory revived in the 1960s and the barriers between political theory and political science began to melt, I think it was this second question that was, was reworked. Murray Bookchin, Eduardo Colombo, Paul Goodman, Colin Ward and others continued to develop anarchist sociology, yet the sense that the anarchist movement had been reinvented and that its mid 20th century expressions distinguished new currents of anarchism from old, steered debates towards the analysis of anarchism and what it was. Since the turn of the millennium and the emergence of post-anarchism, I think this self-reflection has dominated anarchist political theory debates. Such a brilliant literature that has emerged from the late 20th century um, in, with the resurgence of anarchism in the academy has been produced by scholars working in disciplines other than political theory. The fact that it sits elsewhere gives anarchism little purchase in institutional settings that favor specialization. Moreover, political theory presents particular barriers to inclusion. 
the construction of anarchy as the antithesis of the state in prevailing contract theory, the integration of normative concepts like legitimacy in concepts of the state, and the prevalence of conceptual frameworks ill-suited to anarchist perspectives that are often applied to reveal anarchism's failure, make it very difficult to satisfy the basic criteria of political theory, which according to Miller and Seidentop, are logical consistency, empirical adequacy, and theoretical scope. How then should anarchists address marginality? To conclude, I want to suggest that one way is to press James Tully's creative approach to the discipline. Tully suggests that the what is question is not exclusive to anarchists, that it, in fact it's asked by, by all manner of political theorists. It's a general phenomenon in political theory. What is something? He then says the pertinent question is the one that lies behind it. Um, and I quote, what comparative difference does it make to study politics this way rather than that, end quote. His answer led him to distinguish a comprehensive from a subaltern approach to political theory. The first prioritizes justice to examine how equal citizens govern stable institutions of constitutional representative democracy. The second focuses on freedom with a view to making sure that the multiplicity of practices of governance in which we act together do not become closed structures of domination under settled forms of justice, but are always open to practices of freedom by which those subject to them have a say and a handover. So what I want to suggest, um, returning I think to, to Proudhon's political sociology, um, is to say that I think what we should be doing is looking at Tully's distinction between justice and freedom. I think we should dispute it. I don't think that is a, um, it's, I think certainly we, we need to contest it. And I think following the example of the 19th century anarchists, we need to find a way into both positions. Okay, that's it, thanks. Thank you, Ruth. Again, I can hear the applause. I can see them actually, I can see the little hands. There we are. Okay, um, and now I'm gonna hand over to Saul. Saul, over to you. Okay. <clears throat> right, I hope you can hear me all, okay. Okay, um, so thank you very much. Um, I, I, uh, I just, in this talk, I just very briefly just want to kind of take stock of post-anarchism. Um, post-anarchism has been mentioned a few times um, by a number of speakers, actually. I'm surprised it's actually a thing. I mean, I just thought it was like a sort of a sexy kind of uh, a sexy title for, for what I was doing, really, which was just trying to kind of, in a way, synthesize post-structural, post-structuralist theory with, with, with anarchism. Um, but it seems to have taken on a life of its own, really. Um, so I just wanted to kind of just say a few things about um, uh, about, about post-anarchism today. I mean, it, you know, it seems to me kind of an interesting time to be thinking about new forms of anarchism, really. Uh, I mean, it's been, you know, 10 years, what is it, 10 years since the, the Occupy Wall Street movement uh, and the sort of the anarchistic uh, currents, which were uh, sort of part of that. You know, we're living through this strange interregnum of, of COVID where we've seen a number of very interesting and dramatic political developments, you know, the, the unfolding biopolitical state of exception, as well as new forms of, of, of kind of radical politicization, whether it's you know, movements over, um, you know, ecological justice, racial justice, for instance, new forms of viral politics, which I think have just kind of exploded globally um, in very interesting ways, actually. Uh, also, of course, you know, we, we're kind of living, I think, in a period of what I call global anarchy. Um, maybe it's the maybe it's the anarchy of power, but you know, we can point to you know the sort of the, the, the kind of the breakdown and fragmentation of uh, you know the kind of the, you know the liberal kind of global order. Um, you know, the, the complete sort of you know legitimation crisis of existing political institutions. You know, the rise of um, I would say dangerously anarchic forms of, you know, right wing populism, you know, the kind of the far right populist insurrection, which, which we've, you know, been witness to for, uh, um, for some time now, of course. Um, so, so we need to think about what, what anarchism today means, you know, amidst all of these, these kind of very interesting um, uh, sort of conditions and, and circumstances. So, so, so what is, what is post anarchism? Today, uh, I mean, post-anarchism, as I said, has really has really been an attempt, really, to kind of uh, you know rethink certain 
uh, some of the sort of the key theoretical coordinates of anarchist theory through the the lens, if you like, of post-structural theory. So, you know, obviously through thinkers like Michel Foucault, uh, Gilles Deleuze, um, Jacques Derrida, Jacques Lacan, uh, and various other things, very, very sort of post-Heideggerian thinkers, you know, Rainer Sherman and uh, Giorgio Agamben. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, Post or post-structural theory is kind of, the, if you like, the or has been at least the sort of the uh, the sort of the necessary kind of theoretical and political test which anarchism has to sort of pass through if it's to really have any kind of you know relevance to to contemporary political struggles. I mean, it, you know, um, and I, I think it does raise quite sort of important and quite interesting theoretical challenges to the, if you like, the revolutionary meta narrative of you know classical nineteenth-century anarchism. <laughs> So um, it seems to me post-anarchism kind of involves two main theoretical moves. Firstly, it's kind of a critical deconstructive move or a critical deconstruction of some of the kind of the epistemological and ontological limits of classical anarchism. So the anarchism of, of uh, Proudhon, Kropotkin, Bakunin, uh, and, uh, and various other sort of key figures. And of course, this was a kind of an anarchism which was really, you know, born of, of if you like, the revolutionary optimism of the, of the 19th century and of the kind of enlightenment humanism, of rational positivism, you know, the idea that, you know, the revolution was imminent, um, that it was um, uh, that, that a, a kind of a, a sort of a sort of future anarchist society, if you like, was sort of imminent within, you um, uh, within within sort of social relations, if only the state could simply be sort of, as it were, removed, then um, then you know then, then relations of of, uh, of sort of mutual aid, mutual cooperation could simply be allowed to almost organically emerge. And this is you know this is sort of central to um, you know Kropotkin's notion, of course, of mutual aid, which he believed, as we know, was a kind of an evolutionary and biological instinct, which was somehow sort of latent within. Uh, within within all within all human societies. Now, <clears throat> post anarchism, I think, casts some degree of doubt on the sort of the epistemological assumptions which underpin this revolutionary narrative, and which I which I simply don't think are kind of you know tenable or even thinkable uh, today. Um, you know, the idea of a kind of a natural tendency towards uh, mutual cooperation between individuals or a faith in the idea of a kind of a social revolution as a kind of a, a sort of a totalizing a uh, moment which would kind of sweep away existing power structures and uh, redeem humanity. Uh, so I think, you know, we need to, well, what I've been trying to do really is to kind of really ask the question about whether we can make the same assumptions about this revolutionary narrative, whether we can make the same assumptions about a uh, kind of a, a revolutionary subjectivity, a subject who revolts. What does this actually mean today? Who is the subject of revolution? Um, so, uh, so, so, so perhaps there is, we, you know, we, we can't really bank upon a kind of a, if you like, an essential revolutionary identity or essential set of revolutionary identities. And it seems to me that, um, you know, we need to kind of think about subjectivity in, 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 in very different ways. Um, uh, we also, well, I think, need to kind of think beyond the paradigm of identity politics altogether, which seems to me is simply nothing more than a, if you like, a sort of a neoliberal uh, a biopolitics. So post-anarchism, as I see it, is really a politics of singularity and becoming. It's the idea that the subject, as it were, is never a fixed identity, but is always in the process of becoming um, and, uh, and should be understood really as kind of a multiplicity. Foucault once said, and I think this is a very interesting quote, he said um, in quotes, maybe the target nowadays is, to not, is not to discover who we are, but to refuse who we are, to refuse who we are. Um, the functioning of power, I think, is another area of uh, revolutionary thinking which can be challenged or, or rethought. I mean, is, is power really still localizable uh, within this kind of centralized entity um, that we call the sovereign state? Uh, it seems to me that in, in kind of late capitalist modernity, Paris become now takes the form of a kind of a network uh, of relations. Uh, rather than, um, you know, rather than kind of a sort of centralized apparatus. Uh, and this seems to me um, forces us to sort of once again rethink this sort of revolutionary uh, meta-narrative. Anyway, look, many of these ideas that I'm talking about, are, you, you, you're probably all 
no, I mean, I've been sort of talking about this for quite some time. Um, but I just want to sort of touch on a couple of, of sort of key points of what I call the, the reconstructive move of post-anarchism. First, the idea of what I call the non-acceptability of power. And this really uh, it was actually inspired by um, uh, Foucault's idea of what he calls anarchaeology, an anarchy, an anarchaeological approach, where he says that we should always start with the idea, if you like, that power itself is never legitimate, at least never sort of uh, legitimate on its own terms. And if you like, this is really, I suppose, uh, a form of kind of philosophical anarchism. It's the idea that we should always, you know, question the, um, the, the, the sort of the, um, the idea that somehow power is sort of, you know, legitimizable or self-sustaining simply on its own terms. So the way that, I mean, what, what I take from this, I suppose, is the idea that, you know, anarchism should not be thought of as a kind of like a sort of a future goal or some projection towards a future society or some kind of rational telos, which, 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 um, which in a way determines political action. But we should actually, if you like, start with anarchy rather than finish with anarchy. As it were. Other, let's start with, with what I call ontological anarchy. Let's, let's start with the idea that power as a relationship should always be questioned from kind of an ethical point of view. Um, Rather than thinking about what what a kind of a future anarchist society would 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 or might look like, right? Um, so let's start with ontological anarchy and proceed from there. So I suppose what I'm trying to um, arrive at is a notion of anarchy as a form of sort of contingent and indeterminate politics, rather than anarchy, rather than anarchism as a kind of a um, a sort of fixed ideology which is based upon. Uh, uh, based upon some some kind of image of a kind of a, a sort of future anarchist society. The second point: voluntary servitude, voluntary in servitude. Starting, of course, from the very interesting 16th century figure Etienne de La Boissy, who basically asked the question: Why do we obey? Why do we obey tyrannical authority um, if we're not coerced into it? And his point was that all power essentially is based upon voluntary consent and voluntary servitude. Very interesting idea, which I really think is sort of key to any ethics of anarchism. And his point was that um, if all power is really based upon free consent, then in a way, power itself does not exist. Power is a constitutive illusion. It's a retroactive illusion, which is created by our obedience to it. Obedience, in other words, comes first and power is secondary to this. Now, the flip side of this is what I call voluntary inservitude, which is the idea that if all power is a kind of a relationship based upon free consent, then we can simply dispel the illusion of power by recognizing our own ontological freedom, recognizing the fact that we're always already free, but did sim simply didn't know it, simply did not realize it. Two minutes, so. Of insurrection which I take from Max Stirner uh, in The Ego and Its Own. Max Stirner made, uh, uh, drew a very interesting distinction between revolution uh, as a kind of a, um, uh, you know, as a form of uh, 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 you know, politics which seeks to transform external social and economic and political relations on the one hand and insurrection on the other, which really starts with a kind of a, uh, a kind of ethical and micro political transformation of the self. Now, these two terms do not exclude one another, according to Stoner. Stoner says, um, you know, that, that, you know, the insurrection doesn't, doesn't exclude, you know, the revolution. But the revolution starts firstly with, with the kind of the, the ethical insurrection against the self. Right? We have to, if you like, transform ourselves and transform um, in a kind of a spiritual, ethical and micro-political sense our relationship with ourselves and our relationships with other people before, or as kind of, a, uh, as it were, a precondition for any kind of external change to social, political, and economic relationships. Lastly, ontological anarchy, which I've touched upon before. Uh, ontological anarchy, I mean, I take this from the, the, the uh, uh, Heidegger, post Heideggerian thinker, Rainer Sherman, who I mean, I don't have to get into the um, don't have time actually to get into the complexities of, of Heideggerian philosophy, but it's the idea that um, that you know what what we're witnessing, as he put it, is kind of a, a withering away of epochal first principles or 
if you like, ontological foundations or the archi, the notion of the archi, which is a kind of the foundational principle, which as you know, means both origin and rule. So this is really central to anarchy. If, if the archi, the, the sort of the, the ontological origin is kind of withering away as a kind of condition, if you like, of post-modernity, this I think uh, raises very interesting questions about you know about sort of the nature of, um, of 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 radical politics, which we have to come to terms with. All action, he argued, becomes anarchic, which is to say, groundless and without a kind of a predetermined end. So one, one minute, Saul. One minute. Okay, that's fine. No worries. Um, so let's let we need to kind of, uh, if you like, come to terms with ontological anarchy. Um, we, which I think actually has very ambiguous implications for anarchism. Um, you know, we, we, we live in an ontologically, ontologically anarchic world, which is spinning off its hinges. Um, you know, it seems to me the great secret of power's non-existence is being exposed. So, um, so, 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 you know, the question is, you know, how do we as anarchists kind of respond to, if you like, the fragmentation of, uh, of, of power today, uh, as well as to you know, as well as the, the danger that you know the, the the abyss is being or the void is being filled in by new forms and, and new infinitely more dangerous forms of power. So my last point is, uh, and I'm just going to read out this section against this blind and nihilistic drive of the global capitalist machine. Anarchism today must affirm a kind of an ethical care or an ethics of care and even conservation for certain aspects of what already exists, for a natural world which is faced with ecological collapse, as well as to cultivate and affirm new forms of life, community and autonomy, which have already been made possible by the ontological rift opening up before us. So I'm sorry if I've gone a bit, bit over, but uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Saul. Again, I'm sure there's uh, the applause ringing in the background. I can see them actually. Great. Okay. Well, we've had uh, four, five speakers. I'm. It looks as though Elizabeth hasn't made it today. Um, so that means that we now have um, a, just short of an hour for discussion. Um, I did see one question go into the um, into the chat, and I saw that Kathy had a hand up. Um, what I might do is just while everybody's sort of gathering their thoughts and thinking about a question to ask. And ask one of my own of the panelists. And I just wanted a quick answer from each of you, if you don't mind. Nothing to, I mean, they're not particularly big questions, as I don't think they are. Um, the question is, um, what have been the biggest challenges for anarchist studies over the last, let's say, for as long as you've been in the business? And what do you envisage as being uh, the sort of the near future for anarchist studies? Does it look rosy? Can I go back to... Um, can I go back to Jesse? We'll start at the beginning again, and then we'll go through al alphabetically. So what have been the, the biggest challenges for you, Jesse, in anarchist studies since you took this up? And uh, what do you envisage for the next sort of 10 years? Oh, boy, I, I really don't, don't know how to answer that. Um, <clears throat> I, I, well, I don't know. Um, you know, I think I think my, my problems are, are not, not all that interesting. Um, you know, just fi finding finding room in, inside the institution and finding ways to get get a uh, my, my work in anarchist studies evaluated and so forth. That that's that's a you know whatever it is. Um, but 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 uh, you were ask, asking also about the, the biggest challenges in, in anarchist studies right now. Oh boy, I, I think I think uh, Kathy really hit it on the head. Um, I, I think the that um, think, thinking of, of ways to 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 grapple with um, the, with in, indigeneity and, and indigenous anarchism and, and the challenges that, that that poses that that's that's huge um, and and I agree that that uh, new, mater new materialisms are are, are promising in, in in terms of um, opening up opening up some some new ways to to, to make dialogue between anarchism and, and indigenous cultures. Fantastic, thanks, Jesse. Sorry to put you on the spot. Anyway, over to you, uh, Kathy. Oh gosh, I'm not sure either. Um, I, I guess I take I take a, a optimistic solace from all the ways that work on anarchism surprises me. 
and that that wasn't always the case. That when I really started writing about anarchism, which was in graduate school, um, I will date myself by telling you that was the mid seventies. Um, I kept, I mean, I, I kept reading the same thing over and over and that has changed. And it seems to me that there's so many more energies feeding into anarchism. And I, I don't really care if they call themselves anarchists or not. I don't, that doesn't matter to me. What matters is what are they doing? Uh, and, you know, what kind of, what kind of nutrition is this giving us to uh, bring in, you know, to articulate better understandings of things and bring in more dimensions and imagine better. So I, I'm pretty, I think, you know, a lot of good stuff is really happening now. I'm, I'm really excited to be part of this now. Thank you. Over to you, Ruth. Um, yeah, thanks, Alex. I think I agree with Kathy. I don't care whether people call themselves anarchists. Um, and actually, I, I, I think we need to talk to people who don't call themselves anarchists. Um, you know, that's that, that's that's my that's my view. But I mean, as in terms of challenges, I have to say, you know, I've just been incredibly lucky. Um, I've you know, I've 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 had doors open for me and. Um, you know, you've got to push a bit, but but I, you know, I think Jesse said something about, you know, when, you know, the era of Reagan and Thatcher and 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 things got really tough in terms of, um, you know, funding and all of that. Well, you know, that's 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 when I was funded, um, incredibly, and and it's it's always been I've had space. I suppose partly because, um, you know, within political theory, I mean, I was in an institution that didn't really care very much about political theory. So as long as I just sort of uh, didn't annoy anybody they just let me get on doing what I was doing and and um and it was fine um but as, to, as to the future I mean it, it's I mean the, the most fun I have is 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 talking to to people and it's lovely to see in the participant list how many people I've actually met um either in reality or you know on email but you know we're a community and it's and it's a really strong community and and actually we you know I think the best thing is we learn from each other and we just have to keep together and, and keep talking to each other but but i would also i just think people should you know it doesn't matter whether you're anarchist it's 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 the talking that makes the difference thanks so all right right <clears throat> yeah okay so um yeah look i, I agree with riff i mean i've, I've been i've been incredibly lucky I mean, somehow remarkably i've managed to uh, establish a uh, at least up until now, a reasonably secure academic career as a as an anarchist, or as a, as a post anarchist, really. And um, you know, I, uh, you know, uh, so I, I haven't felt in any sense, you know, marginalised or <laughs> persecuted as as an anarchist within the academy. Maybe it's because I, I happen to teach where, where I do, which is perhaps you know quite open to these kinds of ideas. And also, look, I also agree with 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 Kathy as well. I mean, uh, maybe we should just kind of question the whole identity of anarchist studies. What what you know. What does it really matter whether we call ourselves anarchists or not, or whether we, you know, communicate with other anarchists? I mean, I, I, I think that uh, anarchism uh, as a as a kind of a um, an area um, uh, can can only sort of prosper by uh, engaging with other um, uh, other perspectives and trends. You know, in continental philosophy and in new materialisms, we, which where I entirely agree with Kathy. Actually, this is uh, this I think, if, if you like, is the um, is the sort of the new frontier uh, for, for anarchist thought, um, particularly in, in the sort of the current sort of, um, um, uh, you know, sort of horizon of the, the Anthropocene. Um, so we have to engage with, you know, critical animal, animal studies with new materialisms, with object oriented ontology. Uh, it's one of the themes I've been focusing on quite a lot in my, uh, my recent thinking uh, around sort of the idea of uh, uh, what I call ecological entanglement. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so I, I would, uh, I, I would entirely agree that, that, you know, anarchism, I mean, I'm not even sure if anarchism is a kind of a discipline or a distinct way of thinking. I mean, it seems to me anarchism just intersects with so many other different uh, perspectives and, and, and trends and so on. So, um, this is a time for, um, for experimentation, it seems to me in, in kind of anarchist thinking. 
Great, thank you. All right, well, look, let me hand it over to, to our participants. There are a good number of us here. Um, does anyone have any questions for our panelists? Anything they want to raise? Martin. Um, I'm Martin Everett, and I'm from the other anarchist research group, which meets in London, although we haven't met to, for two years during the pandemic. Um, and um, we now call ourselves the New Anarchist Research Group to try and uh, have some distinction between the group in Loughborough and, the, uh, and our much smaller group. Um, but our group was started in uh, about 1980 and grew out of the history workshop movement, was founded by David Goodway. And it um, met in the Institute for Historical Research uh, four or five times a year uh, for about 20 years. And then there was a five year hiatus, five or six year hiatus. And one or two of us um, got together and started it up again. Um, most of our activity is just based on monthly meetings, which are discussion. And we have anarchist and non-anarchist speakers that come along. Um, and um, that's the sum total of our uh, research activity. But um, And our method is basically discussion and talk, and both in the formal meeting and afterwards in the cafe or the pub or wherever it is that we go to. Um, and I would like to just throw one other um, sort of perspective into the mix that we've heard so far, um, because I'm particularly interested in, in two things. One is um, breaking down the boundaries of academia, um, bringing to an end the, its gatekeeper activities on privilege and so on. Um, and also, um, T taking knowledge itself, um, uh, have a greater interplay of knowledge and uh, ideas um, across academic boundaries, um, both from um, people in academia moving out into the community and also by the stimulation of more uh, um, methods which are often thought of as academic or ideas which are often thought of as academic or more books or printed matter which is often thought of academic pushing that out into the community or creating uh, a, a sphere of influence for it and so what I want to do just briefly is mention two or three ideas one of which is poetry the other is germination and the third is fermentation and I'm particularly interested in temporary and ephemeral spaces where ideas are exchanged, where knowledge is actually can be produced. Historically, the universities grew out of just discussion groups around particular thinkers, uh, often religious, um, but they nevertheless produced great ideas for good or for bad. Um, and and they were formed just by uh, groups of people gathering in particular cities and places. Um, there was also the parallel um, uh, establishment of institutions of privilege where particular types of knowledge were taught uh, and surrounded by barriers and required elite activity to participate. Um, but there are also there are other sort of forms which um, it, it, in society um, where ideas can be exchanged, uh, where uh, knowledge can be encouraged to germinate and to expand. Um, such a, you know uh, the bus stop, the picnic, um, when. Uh, people have been involved in revolutionary movements, as in Poland and during the time of Solidarność. Uh, the activists uh, established flying universities there. Something very similar was established in Turkey after the uh, clampdown two or three years ago. Um, and th these were um, opportunities to actually seize control of the or seize back control 
of the ideas and the activity of education and um, push them back into the community and build them on different foundations. And that's what I'm particularly interested in, the, the, the kind of knowledge where, um, you know, the miller would take two or three uh, school children after school and talk to them about uh, different things which they would never have encountered in the state or religious schools a few years ago. Um, Martin, can I, are you going to turn this into a question or? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, I, I, I am going to turn it into a question and very quickly, I've just come into a, an end. Um, but one of the things that I would particularly want to see um, or want to encourage are perhaps um, the um, anarchist studies movement in its wider sense, doing more local and regional activities um, uh, and trying to establish more groups within the community and um, using uh, all sorts of opportunities to um, spread anarchist ideas or to let anarchist ideas of self-organization uh, to actually grow and to ferment and to germinate. So um, what, I've, what, what I've done is I've tried to present one idea of how I think uh, uh, anarchist studies ought to actually a direction anarchist studies ought to move in. And I'd like to know what uh, direction, the what concrete um, sort of activities uh, the, the panel would like to see uh, develop to take anarchist studies forward. Fantastic, thanks Martin. Okay, um, who wants to who wants to respond to that? I could go round the, round the panel or... Um, if anybody want, has anything, Ruth's got a hand up and Cathy too, go for it. You want to go, Cathy? Okay, thanks, Ruth. Um, hi, Martin. Thank you for that. I wanted to say, first of all, that I have benefited over the years from the what's now new anarchist research group in London, and I'm really happy that they exist. Uh, and I think it takes a huge amount of work to keep something like that going over years. So I appreciate it a lot. And the three, art, the three points you make, poetry, germination, fermentation, just, I just have to, I don't have a good answer to your question, Martin, but I think it's really telling that so many of the anarchist journals made during the, the period of time that we tend to call the classical, even though Ruth gave us reasons to be wary of that language. So basically the Paris Commune to the Spanish Revolution. So many of the journals start with a poem. Uh, or there's a poem somewhere in the buried, you know, somewhere in the thing, but like uh, a lot of them, it's the poem is the first thing you see over and over, week after week, month after month, it starts with a poem. And sometimes a poem from a so William Morris or, uh, you know, Shelley, the, but often poems from the activists in that area or poems borrowed from another journal and republished. And I think it's really important to think about that. Why do they keep doing that? This, these were journals put out on a shoestring budget with very little in the way of like, look at how they're put on the page. They have almost no margins. Their print is small. It's, there's no variation in font because they're cramming so much. It's all about getting the information on the page. If it were sure, only a question of efficiency, those recurring poems would have possibly been on the chopping block, but it wasn't just the question of efficiency. Poetry was an invitation. Poetry was a way to, it, to sort of bring people in uh, to kind of loosen up their imaginations and kind of softly uh, bridge them into the, the following prose. So I, I really like thinking about how poetry works and I, I don't know much about it, but I'd like to know more. And the other thing I wanted to say is germination and fermentation. What that reminds me of is Fred Moten and uh, Stephen Harney's idea of radical study. And when they talk about radical study, I think they may have missed bus stops, Martin, but they talk about the streets. They talk about the, the sort of ordinary spaces of life, kitchen tables, and where the radical politics germinates in those places and how it is often not expressed in treatises on the subject, but it's expressed in music, it's expressed in bodies gathering in places. It has different ways of making itself available and, and spreading around. So 
I think all those ideas are important to, to keep pursuing. Thanks, Kathy. Over to Ruth. Hi, Martin. I'm as a Hi. as a lapsed member of the of the new anarchism research group. People it's never really nice. <laughs> yeah, it's very nice to see you. Anyway, um, so I think the last thing you said was, you know, which which directions, and um, would you know, would you would you take it in? And and I think my answer to that is in every direction. So you know, I think a lot of what you're talking about is is kind of happening. So, you know, I think of things, I mean, well, while you were talking, I was thinking of things like dope. Um, I was thinking of the, the publishing that we have now. I was thinking of the, um, I mean, to pick up on stuff that Kathy was saying, I mean, the music we have now, um, you know, every direction, I, you know, it seems to me that one of the things that we can take from the 19th century anarchists is that they, they spoke to as many different audiences as they could. You know, they hit the intellectual journals, they, they set up their own newspapers, they spoke to everybody. The whole idea, I think, or part of what they were doing was that you needed to keep pushing, you know, all the buttons in all the places to, to make anarchism normal. You know, it's not crazy. Um, that, that was the, you know, and, and that was what they were fighting against, the idea that it's crazy, the idea that this is stupid, that it's, it's utopian, it's insane, it's dangerous, all of these things. It's not. Um, and I think, you know, I wouldn't have one direction and I wouldn't have one format. I would have all of them and, and keep doing it. Thanks, Ruth. Jesse, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I just I, 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 I want to say yes to all, all the foregoing. And, and, uh, and also I want, I want to um, put, put a, um, an underline under my, my last suggestion that, that uh, we, we need to, to build our capacity in in, uh, in in science and technology, uh, we, we need some anarchist roboticists. Uh, we, we need some anarchist computer scientists and ep epidemiologists and and so forth. Um, and I'm, I'm I'm excited by some some developments in that direction, but but we need more. Great. And if I could just jump in as well, I mean, one of the things that we notice about the stuff that's getting published, of course, is that much of the academic work comes out of people's activism. So people are coming out of Food Not Bombs or the punk movement. I see Jim nodding there. Uh, you know, and you can see this, this work is being, it's, it's a sort of, the academy gives people a bit of space to think slowly and carefully about the sorts of things that they've been involved with. And I think that, that, that that's really privileged. And I think that's what people were saying earlier. But that doesn't detract. It, in fact, gives more impetus to the work that they were doing on the streets, if you like, anyway. And I think that that, that connection is really important. It's not as though, I don't see that there's a, there's one space where one type of research goes on and something else goes on elsewhere. I think it's way messier than that. That's what I've experienced anyway. Are there any other questions for our panelists? Indeed, for you, for the for anyone else that's here. I can see a hand. Is that Mona? Do you want to jump in? Yes, I want to. I mean, underscore a lot of what um, Martin and. All the others have just more recently had to had to say my academic career of 40 years was at an educational institution hampshire college that dissolved all disciplinary boundaries um, to start with there were no economics departments sociology departments political science etc and now as the college itself has been and there was a real encouragement of of us as faculty and researchers to actually um, incorporate the community in meaningful ways into the work that we were doing in the research and the learning. I mean, the idea was, and I'm a geographer, so geography and anarchism has long history. And my dissertation was on the Spanish revolution. And <clears throat> it was through interviewing people like Federico Monsigny and others who were um, in Southern France at the end of the Civil War and learning how they were spreading their ideas through um, uh, their journals and through stories and through novels and short stories and just searching for ways to, to um, reach people really that inspired me in the way I approached my academic work and 
and writing. And it was always about breaking down those boundaries between the university and the college and the larger community. And I just wonder as a question, for those of you who are still within academic institutions, whether you've, you, are, you have been successful at all in breaking down those boundaries, both within the institutions that you work in and between the institution and the larger community and larger world and what sort of initiatives are underway in the institutions you work in. Such a shame that Elizabeth couldn't be here because I was hoping that she would speak to this as she, she's part of the Free University in Brighton where she's trying to break down those barriers and bring education uh, to people that don't have access to it and so on. Um, but, um, and I could say a whole bunch of things on this topic, but I, I'm sure everyone else could too. Does um, anyone want to jump in on this? What sort of things are going on? Kathy. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, yeah, I have a, a few things that come to mind. Um, one is that, as I'm sure a lot of us have had experience with, a lot academics tend to be more timid than they need to be. And a lot of times the institutional spaces that we're in can tolerate more pushing than we push. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that'd be one thing for us to do is look around and see, you know, where we could try. And I, mm -hmm. I say that from a position of comfort, which is that I'm in a department that is political science department at the University of Hawaii is basically changed in the 60s when Evergreen was created and uh, the, the other, a lot of the other quote experiments and we never changed back. So we have a very democratic department. Graduate students vote one person, one vote, the same as faculty and we make policy together. And we can do that because for the most part, unless we don't turn our grades in on time, the university doesn't care what we do. And so thank God for that because then we do what we want. And I realize that there are many university systems that are more in a day-to-day -day way watching. Uh, and I see ours as moving in that direction because that's the way of neoliberalism, right? Is that kind of management of process so that everything else dies. Um, but still, it's, I think it's possible. And, and I think that, um, there, that finding those spaces, helping our students find those spaces is a, is a real thing that we can do. And then push on them, make them a little bigger, a little better. And the other thing is that it helps enormously, and here again, I'm very uh, well-placed, it helps enormously to be in a place where there's an active and local movement. And Native Hawaiian sovereignty is a very powerful thing here. And it's, it's one of the reasons I wanted to come here. It's one of the reasons I wanna stay here is I really love teaching in a place where an indigenous critique of colonialism and a, a set of alternative institutions are being built. And, connect to that, you know, like I don't start from the scratch here, I, I connect with them. So I guess I think those are two ways that we can do more or do better. Thanks, Kathy. I know that in our projects, and I know other people that run projects, this similarly where we support people, uh, non-academic uh, people who are working on the peripheries of academia to, to work with us and, and use that, that, that the, the institution to promote particular types of research, to support particular types of research, either through formal methods of co-production or, or whatever it happens to be. In those ways, we can, again, break down those barriers and try and enable people um, to access higher education. Andy. Is this, you're on mute, mate. Still muted. Oh, there we go. All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, Andrew Hoyt, I'm a um, history PhD. Uh, there's, I've kind of been bopping in and out because I'm um, having power problems up here in the Sierra, but uh, just wanted to um, add a perspective on, on the big question of this uh, panel, which was around um, still marginal or not. Um, and it struck me that everyone on the panel is like tenured professors. Um, uh, so I finished my PhD in 2018. Um, I'm adjuncting at multiple institutions, um, you know, facing ex extreme barrier and prejudice against um, 
uh, full-time work because I study anarchists. It's like not even a vague question to me that studying anarchists is a marginal thing. It's like heavily stigmatized. Um, so it's like, I don't know. That's just like the, the, the extremely clear thing. I think there's a bunch of people, other people here in this chat um, on the Zoom meeting who are even more marginal than I am in terms of um, being connected to the academy, uh, having degrees, um, having all that, the prestige that comes with the with full-time employment. So I think that we um, kind of like step back and, and be like, it's not like we're just helping people, you know, um, on the periphery of the academy because they choose to be on the periphery of the academy and are kind of maybe halfway involved with anarchist studies. Like a lot of people can't get into the academy because they are involved with anarchist studies. Um, and so that's just, a, I think, a reality that looms really strong for me. And then um, the other thing I'd say is like, uh, it, it, it always strikes me that there's, um, within the kind of umbrella of anarchist studies, there's a big divide between the, um, say, people who are doing their, their post-anarchy theory, um, philosophizing, you know, that historically, uh, anarchist theory has always been in a much more um, safe place for the society. Um, you know, it, back to the trials in France, you know, the philosophical anarchists were insulated. Um, people I, I study were, you know, I studied the Gallianisti, I studied people who uh, blew up judges' houses and attorney generals' houses. Um, that kind of thing is, is stigmatized unless you're studying it as like a terrorist group. Um, People who are studying contemporary struggles, I think, also face a, you know barriers to this, uh, depending on um, their own kind of um, context and who they're studying. But it's clear if I was studying like you know the Italian Communist Party, I would not be facing the same kind of barriers. Um, and you know, I've as a graduate student in 2017, there was a uh, a professor teaching a class on anti-statist 19th century struggles that didn't include any anarchists in it um, because they didn't know it because they were professors to were raised up, you know, with Marxism and, and, uh, you know, liberal politics and, um, and civil rights struggles or what, I mean, they just didn't, they don't have the, the background, the anarchist studies, the history of the anarchist movement is incredibly buried. I think that there's a big difference if I say I'm an anarchist historian or if I'm a historian who studies anarchists, right? Anarchist historians suggest some kind of, um, particular process approach to doing history, um, which could be debated about and, and discussed. Studying anarchists is, um, is something that's much harder to justify within the academy um, because it's much less uh, esoteric and it's much more about these uh, grassroots people who did things and had beliefs that probably a lot of people in the academy don't exactly agree with. Um, so yeah, I think it's really need to um, distinguish between like, the kind of uh, philosophical anarchist or client kind of uh, and, uh, horizontal I think, things to theory and build. there's lots of room for that in the academy. But um, working with anarchists, being part, identifying as an anarchist, being part of the anarchist movement, and studying actual anarchists who actually did uh, real actions in the world is a whole different um, kettle and fish. So that's all I'd say. Thank you. Cheers, Andy. We've got a couple of more hands up and there's a question in the in the chat from Soren that I would like to come back to as well. Um, Ms. Sam and Michael, do you want to speak to this subject or do you have, yep, yeah, go for it then. Ms. Sam, over to you. Hi, thanks for having me, I'm new here. Um, yeah, my, my question has been partially answered but building on, on this last discussion, I think um, the barriers many anarchists face to um, entering academia and studying anarchists in the academic context is not just because they identify as anarchists or want to study it as a subject, but also because a lot of anarchists um, have taken a sort of unorthodox path, um, at least many that I know, and this includes me. And so entering or returning to academia can seem and actually be really, really tricky. And I've struggled with this. I have a background in philosophy and um, human geography. Uh, dropped out of my master's to become an activist because I became disillusioned with um, academia. And now, 
you know, I have four years of not really knowing what to put on my CV. I mean, <laughs> um, self-organized projects, struggles in various countries, squatting and spending all my time on the house. I, I don't know. And then um, every time I think about starting a PhD, because I do think there's so much interesting research happening now, I look at the requirements and they want two references, you know, academic employees, and I, I already give up. Um, and so I guess my question is, how to maybe reduce these kinds of access barriers too for for act for people who come from this activist or, or music background, as some of you have mentioned, to to enter and and actually thrive uh, within academia. Um, and yeah, um, and I guess uh, I don't know if I would call the the study of anarchism marginal, but compared to the praxis of of anarchism, it is marginal because anarchism and practice it's it to me it a small a small a anarchism maybe it does seem to be everywhere I mean interstitial may be invisible sometimes but definitely not marginal and I wish so much more of that um could be reflected um in academia not just as sort of case studies um yeah that's half a comment half a question I think that's enough yes thank you thanks Lisanne you've there are plenty of people i can see around the room who would be more than happy to help if you need a help into higher education so just you know it's about making those contacts i think and i think you know that's the first step so thank you um michael over to you yes thank you i'm also uh quite new to uh anarchist study i'm very young just trying to get into academia um i had a question for uh for kathy actually because i'm i'm i hear you're uh working um with um uh hawaiian uh movements and 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 uh uh theory perhaps as well um and i i, I just had a question because i am very interested and this also comes back partially to to Saul's uh, talk i'm very interested in uh, uh the philosophy behind anarchism especially ontologically and metaphysically um and I, I find that I can uh, I can get a lot of inspiration and a lot of uh, um, interesting ideas I can find in uh, indigenous uh, theories and and uh, metaphysics uh, and so on. And I always have a lot of trouble as a, a white European trying to engage with that uh, with those theories, those um, practices a lot of the time as well. Um, especially because I, I worry that um that uh that there's a there's a very there's an importance in, in 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 having a dialogue and not just trying to um sort of colonize ideas right and i i was i i worry about that quite a lot and especially um about um perhaps um uh ap approaching people or approaching uh, theorists, approaching um, uh, anyone who has that kind of knowledge, um, and and being like, hey, I want, I you know, I want to engage in dialogue, um, but that's still, you know, that's still my desire to to uh, uh, um, uh, to be able to approach that knowledge. Do you, do you see what I mean? Like there, there's a there's a there's a there's an inherent problem there where i feel like people might not be interested in capital a anarchism at all and think you know what are you doing here um this is this is not my my concern and i don't know i'm, I'm i have to, i have trouble and I, I i was wondering if you could say anything about it but i'm noticing now that i have trouble form uh, formulating my trouble with it um i hope i hope it sort of makes sense it yeah, does, Michael. Thank, Over to you, Kathy. Thank you, Michael. I, I totally get, I'm going to reduce this complex idea to what's a nice white girl like you doing in a Native Hawaiian activist uh, space. Um, I, we, we have to feel our way. And we certainly, I think you kind of already know, I think you're groping toward a, a good way of explaining it and doing it, but we certainly want to interact and not dominate. We want to uh, learn, not appropriate. Uh, we want to offer what we can without assuming that we've brought the answers, but simply that we can 
learn together. Um, so here are, here are a few specific things is that um, I, because I'm in a, uh, I'm in actually two departments, I'm in political science and women's studies, and we both have a, a fairly large and very vigorous indigenous uh, politics and indigenous feminist component, that one of the things that, there's things that are very concrete that um, are, could maybe work as examples, that the specific thing won't work for everybody because you gotta be in, in this kind of position, but the general thing might work. And one is that I try to um, tilt the kind of political theory that I do in a kind of indigenous friendly direction. Okay, so I'm not gonna teach a class called indigenous politics. We've got three fabulous indigenous scholars doing that. They, they don't need a wannabe around them, but I can take my political theory class and I can add Lucretius or I can add Spinoza, or I can add people who you know aren't the, the canon, right? But who open up dimensions of Western thinking that are much more compatible with indigenous thought, um, that they have a rich presence. They're the, mi the minoritarian traditions of Western thought that can connect up um, and have interesting conversations with indigenous politics. And so that gives me a way to contribute to the indigenous politics world. It gives my students a way to connect across a variety of different literatures and projects. Um, and, you know, I think everybody benefits from that. If, if we just think about what can I bring to the table? How can I offer it in a way that's not, you know, one more colonizing gesture, but, and, but instead a sort of genuine effort to be a comrade. And, you know, I think we can then find those. Thanks, Kathy. Um, Soren, do you want to ask the question that you put in the chat earlier? Sure, yeah, I can do that. Um, here, I'll, I'll try to put on my video. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to, uh, I had a question earlier uh, for Saul. So I don't know much about post, uh, <laughs> post anarchism. That's not uh, my area at all. But I guess I just wanted to uh, clarify what uh, you meant by identity politics in the context of uh, your comments uh, earlier. Um, at whether it whether you're referring to sort of the the quite shallow representation politics of something like um, you know uh, uh, Hillary Clinton breaking the glass ceiling kind of situation, or are we talking about identity politics in the context of like the Combahee River Collective, which were a bunch of uh, black uh, female socialists, many of whom uh, were also queer, and uh, we're talking about intersecting identities and, and uh, sort of uh, axes of oppression rather than um anything to do at all with what we sort of know as identity politics today uh, which i agree is is quite a, a reductive and, and rather useless uh, um, uh lens uh yeah thanks for the question um yeah so i i think what, what i'm trying to um critique is is kind of the politics of representation which is to say a, a form of politics which um seeks to um represent certain identities within, within the sort of the kind of the normalized categories of, of the state um, and whether it's in the form of you know granting of rights or the um you know the recognition of, of you know one's you know gender or sexuality or uh, you know even sort of cultural minority status and so on i mean i i mean to me the trouble with this is that it's a dead end for politics and it imprisons the subject within a certain kind of identity category um, the whole impetus of, of post-structural thought, as I see it, is to actually think beyond and outside identity and, and outside sort of categories of, of, of the subject, even, even marginalized forms of subjectivity. We need to think about the subject in terms of singularities and multiplicities, which, which, which are always contingent, always in a process of becoming flux and transformation. Because if we imprison our politics within the category of identity, we, we're simply imprisoned by, by the state, which is only too happy to, to grant differential rights to different marginalized groups. So it's, it's, a, it's a, as I said, it's from kind of, you know, sort of liberal or neoliberal biopolitics really, which doesn't really get us anywhere. It fits very easily into the kind of the, the framework of, 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 of global capitalism and the neoliberal state. 
Right, Great. So thank, thank you. And yeah, I, I think I use I tend to use the term representation politics just to distinguish because I always get mm -hmm. I never know what people are referring to if they're re rejecting A or B. So that's that's sure. what I do. And I, by the way, I'm not just talking about the identity politics of the left. I mean, I mean, the worst kind of identity politics is that of the right, isn't it? You know, um, also, it, yes, white, white identitarian is definitely. Yeah, a exactly. That's right. That, that's the most, um, you know, the, the most most sort of, you know, vicious and, and visceral form of identity politics, I think. Um, but anyway, yeah, thank you. Cheers, all. Thanks, Soren. Ifni. Thank you. Hi, I, um, I absolutely love the conversation and I really um, wanted to again appreciate Michael's attempt to articulate something that I think is really pivotal in this moment in anarchist studies and in kind of how we are going to wrangle with um, genocide and, and, and indigenous struggles. Um, so my, my question isn't actually going to be a question, <laughs> full disclosure. Um, I did a talk on how to begin the process of decolonizing your own academic institution at the North American Anarchist Studies Network Conference in Mexico City. Um, and what I wanted to just bring forward today is, you know, not letting uh, fear of fucking up FOFU uh, arrest our attempts to try to um, uh, take risks and, and do what we can. Uh, you know, I what, I really appreciated Kathy Kathy Ferguson's kind of comments, you know, about what indigeneity and have and, and anarchy have in common. But one of the other things they have in common is that they are not monolithic. So what some might call indigenous anarchism is anathema to a lot of indigenous activists. Um, so it is important to proceed with caution. There are traditional governance models and communi communities that are variegated and uh, you know and and in, and sometimes really not uh, consistent uh, with, I guess, what you know uh, a card carrying anarchist might conceive of when it comes to. Um, uh, the, the the commonalities that are shared amongst the struggles. Sometimes it just comes down to that we all have the same enemies, right? Um, I think for anarchist scholars, uh, you know, looking for ways to elevate voices. So Glenn Cotard uh, talks about, uh, he, he has a term called grounded normativity that I think is really useful, which is essentially kind of place-based solidarity, right? So it's kind of, a, it's an ethical framework that's, that's very much about where you are uh, spatially, um, and the associated knowledge that goes along with that. So wherever you are, whatever academic institution you might be affiliated with or alienated from uh, or have bounced from, whatever kind of work you're doing, you can look around at where you are and, and do extra due diligence to find out um, what struggles are going on there that you're not seeing or that are that are um, being invisibilized, right? So, and in addition to kind of Martin's comments on fermentation and, and germination and poetry, you know, there's there are there's an opportunity for subversion. There's an opportunity for a diversion, and it comes down to location, 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 which of course is also known as context. Um, inviting and consulting indigenous speakers and thinkers and writers in the area that you work and live into your curricula, you know, and not just for free with compensation honoraria where you can get them, uh, and and looking for ways to not just segregate indigeneity to a unit about indigeneity, right? But weaving those voices throughout whatever the work is that you're doing. Indigeneity is not a resource for anarchists or anybody else to exploit or co-op. There's ongoing genocide and ongoing land expropriation, and there's responsibility and accountability that comes with benefiting from the spoils of of those processes. So decolonization is predicated on relationship building. So we need to build relationships and that's really scary and it involves a lot of alienation and mistakes and that's just gonna be part of it. So just kind of readying yourself conceptually for the day when you're gonna make it, you're gonna put your foot in your mouth and saying and saying make like kind of uh, conditioning yourself to have the first word that comes out of your mouth when someone says, hey, you did something <laughs> wrong be thank you, right? So gratitude is really important. And then just also, I, lastly, I just wanted to say, you know, what does it mean to study and write about life and death struggles of, of sometimes ourselves, but sometimes other people's life and death struggles to fight these oppressions? What are our ethical responsibilities uh, when it comes down to what we choose to research, what we choose to elevate, right? So how can we funnel resources outward from the academy and reinvite the streets into exclusionist spaces of sanctioned knowledge production? Anyway, I love you all. That's what I wanted to say. Thanks, Ifni. Um, I'm gonna, we've got about five minutes left. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna let Andy speak and then hand over to Beatrice uh, and we can, and we'll close after that, um, if that's okay with you. Um, over to you, Andy. Hey, thanks, Alex. Um, I, I just wanted to come back because my last comment was, was kind of um, 
negative or not, or, you know, not putting anything forward. And I wanted to suggest something um, as far as directions and futures and um, applications. Um, first, prime, you know, as, uh, as a historian, uh, thinking about where the history of the historical anarchist struggle and, and the recording of contemporary struggles and archiving of contemporary struggles is, this is a huge amount of um, really exciting work to be done. The, the truth is that a lot of the history has, is really subpar history that we have to build off of the past. It's history of the big, you know, spectacular moments and um, biographies of the big individuals. And there's a, a lot of work, network analysis, all kinds of amazing things that to do that actually really help um, everyone be able to see the power and impact of the historical movement and, um, and to understand how anarchism functioned and what allowed people to do and what it still allows people to do and why it remains such a vital um, force uh, outside of the political norms. And um, so I think there's really a lot of exciting uh, work in terms of uh, anarchist studies and within the, the field of history. And, um, and as far as, as, as educating, the two places where I am adjuncting right now are um, involved with prison education. And there's a, um, and teaching in person in the, in the California prison system uh, and teaching Howard Zinn, teaching James C. Scott, teaching um, really anarchist histories um, in the prison system is is really, really exciting and powerful. And the response of people who really understand what the state means in a, in a, um, a very real physical way um, is, is been amazing. I've had a single bad interaction with any student um, based upon that work. And um, I think that there's gonna be a lot more of prison education to be done in the future um, so I want to encourage people, especially um, young uh, academics and stuff who are able to get through the barriers to have the degree to be able to teach in the prisons and also somehow get out there without having gotten the criminal record um, that would prevent you from being able to get in there. You know, if you fit that little um, narrow window that somehow I managed to slide through, um, there's something there that's really exciting and I think revolutionary and, um, and, and could be really a game changer going forward if we continue to um, be able to teach radical ideas in to to the um, incarcerated class. Um, so those are two, two hopeful visions for for anarchist studies going forward. Cheers, Andy. Beatrice. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi, um, Brings from Mexico City. And hi, Kari. I wanted to ask you if you can expand on your experience in Hawaii regarding on how anarchism and indigenous uh, worldviews and practices inform one another. If we think on the resistance resulting from the asymmetrical power in the colonial encounter and how indigenous are still marginal in terms of self-governance, and then in the marginality, the stigma, surveillance, and retaliations that uh, haunted anarchists historically has created, how can we reconcile our cultural reproduction needs without, uh, within the ecological crisis that we face, like you have the Camilo Beach, for example, really close in, and how can we do it in theory and practice, not only by being mutually inclusive, but also not intrusive. Thank you. Nice small question to close us up with, Kathy. <laughs> um, I'll give you a couple of minutes. Okay, well, that's a pretty big one. Um, well, I think, first of all, that I need to point you toward the people who are helping me understand this rather than me speaking for them. Tootie Baker has a fabulous piece uh, in the new uh, uh, ed edition. Help me out here, you guys. Uh, Kehau Kanua edited a recent es issue of contemporary- Anarchist, Anarchist Development Cultural Studies. That's it, Anarchist Developments and Cultural Studies. And it's a great collection. And she has a wonderful, what I think of as really close, robust ethnography of a, 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 what is called a health center here, but it's actually much more than that. Um, and how it, it brings sort of anarchist practices into um, sort of a productive uh, co-creativeness with uh, native Hawaiian practices. So that's a really good one. Kahala Johnson is another of, these are my students, I'm proud to say. Um, Kahala Johnson has, has uh, co-written a really great piece that Carl and Adam uh, published um, in one of the in one of their collections, and uh, Kahala talks a lot about. He takes on this hard question of how do you have sovereignty in a in a way that is informed by anarchist insights, and you know he he pushes it, 
and I think it's really valuable. Um, um, there's more, more, but I don't, I won't just chart the bibliography. I'd be glad to send any of these references to anybody who's interested. But I guess my answer to that is you find the people who are already doing it and you learn from them and you join them. I'm not charting that course. I'm not in a position to chart that course, but I have a little bit of a contribution to make uh, it, because I bring different resources and because I have opportunities because I'm a professor in an established place. Like we have more native Hawaiian graduate students in our PhD program than any other department in the whole university except College of Ed. So that's another way is you don't open up exactly what several of you've already said, open up the resources that you've got to unconventionally prepared people. They're not unprepared, they are unconventionally prepared. They, they bring a lot to the university. And, and again, I think departments, at least here, are more, um, have more control over that than they typically want to, to say. Because again, I come back to, I think academics are kind of a timid crowd um, and they tend to uh, not push as hard as they could. So bring in students, bring in people who will speak, as you said, and uh, make it possible for them to be part of your academic order, but not, I'm not, I'm, I'm learning from this. I'm not, you know, mm. the person in charge. What a great place to end. Um, thank you so much, Kathy. Uh, thank you, Saul. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, thank you, Ruth. Um, Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you in particular to James for making us all feel so relaxed. Um, I, I just wish I was in bed right now. I'm going to be in a couple of hours. Uh, and uh, I hope this has been thought provoking. Um, and thank you all for coming. Mm -hmm.